<laughs> Hello, good, good afternoon and thanks very much indeed for this invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you to try to summarize what we know nowadays about the potential applications of cannabinoids in oncology in the cancer field. First, I will deal a little bit with the most known potential applications of cannabinoids in oncology, that is the palliative actions of cannabinoids on cancer patients. And then I will focus a little as well on another potential application of cannabinoids in oncology that means whether these compounds maybe in the future could be used as anti-tumor drugs, not to palliate cancer symptoms, but to try to manage to stop tumor growth in patients. So first, yeah, let's go, wait a second, yeah. So first, let's try to remember just a little bit what the plant of cannabis has, what is the composition of the plant, and of course, making clear that not every plant of cannabis is the same. So you know that cannabis is a very complex plant. Nowadays, it is believed that there are 300,000 different species of plants on the earth, but only one that we know so far, cannabis sativa, produces these very peculiar compounds, the cannabinoids. Cannabis sativa has, most likely you know, more than 100 different types of cannabinoids. And of course, the best known one is Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, TAC because it's usually the most abundant cannabinoid in most plant preparations. And on the other hand, it's usually the most potent, biologically potent cannabinoid. So if we put together those two features, high abundance and high potency, TAC is usually, as you know, the paradigmatic cannabinoid, the most responsible, the main responsible of the cannabinoids within the plant to make this plant be bioactive in our body. But you also know well that there are many other accompaniers to TAC. There are many other cannabinoids in the plant and usually the second cannabinoid in relevance is CBD, cannabidiol. Cannabidiol is not psychoactive. It usually, on the contrary, tends to palliate, tends to decrease and to temper the psychoactive actions of TAC so that the plant that has high levels of cannabidiol is usually very well tolerated. And CBD has also some interesting therapeutic properties by itself. For instance, palliating epilepsy, for instance, trying to um, make uh, pain, mostly inflammatory pain to get down, etc. So although there are other many other cannabinoids within the plant. Today, today, nowadays, we know quite well what is the pharmacology of TSC, what is the pharmacology of CBD, whereas the rest of the compounds are not so well known, and they are usually minor compounds in the plant. So just as an approximation, it's not absolutely true, but just as an approximation, you can believe that the pharmacological properties of a particular plant cannabis is the result of the relative amounts and absolute amounts of TSC and CBD within it. So we have on the one hand, you know, plants which are very rich in TSC. On the other hand, you have, we have plants that are very rich in CBD. Not very useful, but sometimes. And sometimes we have plants which are in between TSC CBD with different ratios. You know as well, I think, that cannabinoids, the active compounds of cannabis, does, do not act on our body by magics. They act because they have a specific molecules that bind them, that recognize them, that sense them, and therefore make our tissues, our organs, to be sensitive to cannabinoids. And those molecules that, say, receive cannabinoids on the surface of our cells are called, therefore, cannabinoid receptors. So here is just an example, a simplified example of a neuron in our brain that has one of these cannabinoid receptors, one of these cannabinoid sensors. There are two types, one and two, but this is not relevant now. And TAC, like a key within a lock, can be recognized by this particular receptor. So what we can conclude from this is that only the cells of our body that have these locks for 
this locks for TAC, for the key that would be TAC, are responsive, are, can, be, can recognize cannabinoids and are responsive to cannabinoids. Where are the neurons or other cells in our body that do not have these sensors, these receptors, cannot recognize TAC and therefore they are not sensitive to TAC. So there are parts in our brain, parts in our body that can be sensitive to cannabinoids because they have receptors and some other parts of our brain that do not have receptors and therefore cannot respond to cannabis. Well, with these basic ideas in mind, let's go to what cannabinoids, TAC, CBD and others can do on cancer patients. Specifically trying to imagine what, is, what are the main symptoms of cancer and whether cannabinoids can palliate these symptoms in cancer patients. You know that there are diff different sources of TAC and other cannabinoids. On the one hand, we have the plant, of course, cannabis sativa. There are some medicines that have been developed and are officially approved in some countries in the world, such as Sativex and oral spray, Marino, which are pills of TAC, and Sesame, which are pills of a synthetic derivative of TAC that is called Navilon, which acts very similar on our body and compared to TSC. Irrespective of what is the origin of the cannabinoid, for instance, TSC, these are, I think, the most relevant applications of cannabinoids in cancer palliation. The first one you know very well is the inhibition of nausea and vomiting. You know that chemotherapy in cancer many times induces nausea and vomiting and then it's really very nasty for the patients. So cannabinoids have receptors in some parts of our brain stem on the lower part of our brain and also on the nerve terminals that control the contraction of the esophagus so that cannabinoids relax those contractions. Therefore, they inhibit the reflex of nausea and vomiting. For instance, in official medicine, Marinol and Sesame are approved in different countries in the world and medical marijuana you know as well. What is the efficacy of cannabinoids in this uh, particular uh, process? Are cannabinoids good anti-nausea compounds? Are they bad? Are they in between compared to other drugs that are currently used? So in general, we believe that cannabinoids are better than the classical anti-emetic drugs that, it, that are called D2 antagonists. They are kind of so-so with the currently used um, anti-emetic drugs that are called cetrons, chemically speaking, pharmacologically speaking, they are antagonists of one of these HC receptors, I mean the serotonin receptors, and that's an, not relevant, but I would say that overall cannabinoids are pretty good anti nausea compounds. In general, they work better to inhibit prolonged nausea than acute nausea when a patient goes to a chemotherapy session Sometimes nausea occurs within the same session or very little afterwards, even sometimes uh, before because of a psychological predisposition against the, the, the chemotherapy. But some other times nausea occurs one day, two days, three days after chemotherapy. That is what we call long-term nausea compared to short-term nausea. So cannabinoids are usually better to prevent, to turn down long-term nausea than short-term nausea. But they are used for both types of, of nausea. Well, the second application that you also know well is to stimulate appetite when one smokes, appetite increases, and to increase what we call in metabolic terms anabolism. That is, when we eat, we can either burn that food or we can use that food for being stored in our body. That second process is called anabolism. So cannabinoids not only make us eat more, but also store more the nutrients we take. And overall, for these two processes, cannabinoids are good for palliating, for decreasing, for attenuating weight loss in cancers that are in patients that are suffering from cancer in a chronic stage. You know that the weight loss, what is called cachexia, is one of the most nasty effects that a cancer patient may have. They lose weight in advanced stage very rapidly, and that sometimes is the cause of death, in fact, in those patients. So cannabinoids can prevent, can attenuate cachexia pretty efficiently. They are usually, uh, the, well, there are different drugs that are currently used for preventing 
Cachexia, estero is the most current one. They have very nasty secondary effects, but they are pretty effective sometimes in patients. Cannabinoids are usually a little less e efficient than these drugs, but they have a more a safer uh, profile, a safer pharmacological profile that is less negative effects, less secondary effects. So at the end, they can be so-so compared to current anti uh, compounds. The third one is analgesia, that is decreasing pain, inhibiting pain. You know very well that cannabis is analgesic. It's one of the most effective and widely used analgesic, or at least long used analgesic, which was maybe one of the first uses of cannabis in all Western, in all Eastern um, societies some 50 centuries ago. And for instance, Sativex is approved in Canada to palliate uh, cancer-related pain. Medical marijuana is also prescribed to patients in some countries in the world to palliate pain. And I would say that cannabinoids in this respect are kind of similar to moderate opioids, such as codeine. A stronger opioid, such as morphine, is usually stronger than cannabinoids, but also have a stronger secondary effect. So at the end, pain is a very complex process. There are many different types of pain, and depending on the, on the patient, sometimes it's better to use some kind of ibuprofen or paracetamol, aspirin, etc. Sometimes it's better to use esteroids, sometimes it's better to use opioids, and sometimes, of course, it's better to use cannabinoids. They are more efficient than others in some patients. And the fourth one is how cannabinoids affect mood. That is also very important, not only for all of us, but mostly for patients which are in a chronic stage, such as many cancer patients. So increasing uh, our mood, decreasing anxiety, decreasing depression, etc., is, of course, pretty important for those patients. And cannabinoids, you know, are compounds that kill anxiety and depression can make us feel better and so on. So still they are not used so much for this precise uh, problem in cancer patients, but it's something that accompanies the other three uh, different uh, processes when they are taken by cancer patients. So all in all, just to conclude this part, yeah, to make a little summary of what we know today, whether cannabinoids can be used as palliative drugs and how good or bad they are, in which precise patients they are better, they are worse. I would say, of course, that I was developing now that cannabinoids are effective as palliative medicines in cancer patients. Some standard medicines can be stronger than cannabinoids in efficacy to palliate some of the of, the, of these problems, of these symptoms of cancer, but sometimes when these drugs are stronger, they are also stronger in secondary effects. So at the end, cannabinoids have a very good balance between therapeutic effects and non-desired uh, effects. Sometimes, of course, cannabinoids are not so well tolerated by some patients, but usually when we have plants or extracts rich in CBD, we can have quite a good tolerability of those plants, much better than when TSC is the only relevant cannabinoid in the preparation, as you know well. So when can you use cannabinoids, or when is it recommendable to use cannabinoids instead of the standard or accompanying the standard medicines that are used to palliate these bad symptoms of, of cancer? For instance, there are patients that either A, do not tolerate, or B, do not respond well to those medicines. Sometimes those standard medicines do not make any good effect or they do an effect for a time and then patients become tolerant. Or sometimes those patients from the very beginning, they do not respond well to cannabinoids. So we can replace, those, do not respond well to those standard medicines. So we could replace those standard medicines by cannabinoids. So cannabinoids could be an alternative therapy um, instead of uh, classical therapies in those patients. C, there are patients that do not respond well to those medicines, but they respond partially. So sometimes when we combine cannabinoids with other standard therapy, we can have what we call a synergic effect. We can have a very strong effect when putting together two different medicines. That happens, for instance, in the treatment of pain. That is maybe the most relevant effect, the one that is better illustrated in the scientific um, literature. Some patients do not respond well to opioids, to morphine, for instance, or morphine exerts very strong side effects on those patients. When we put together in those patients a little bit of morphine with a little bit of cannabinoids, the two together have a very strong synergic effect. They act together, they cooperate together to have a very strong 
effect on the patient, a very strong analgesic effect of, on the patient. That means that when using some cannabis, we can decrease the amount of opioids that are used by those patients, therefore decreasing very clearly, very significantly, the side effects that are produced by morphine. So a little bit of cannabis and a little bit of morphine sometimes is much, much better than some cannabis and some morphine when they are used by separate. So looking for those combinational therapies, those mixtures of compounds is usually very, or can be very effective in, in the treatment of, of the symptoms of cancer. And the, and I think it's the most relevant application of cancer, cannabis nowadays in the palliation of cancer symptoms, is to increase the overall life quality of cancer patients. I mean, at the end, cannabis, one unique compound or a mixture of compounds, TSC plus CBD, can exert anti nausea effects, can exert pain killing effects, can increase appetite, can decrease weight loss, can decrease anxiety, can decrease depression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So only with one drug, we make the same as when combining four, five, six different types of drugs. And that is really relevant because usually those patients are very debilitated and when they are treated by many different types of compounds, they have a lot of secondary effects and their body sometimes do not react well and cannot tolerate well that big cocktail of drugs. So sometimes we can change those drugs, the complex mixture of drugs with one unique compound, TAC, or C plus CBD or CBD alone, depending on the patient, so that we can have a better response and less secondary effects. So overall, I would say that yes, cannabinoids can be used as palliative drugs in cancer, sometimes more effectively, sometimes it's not, they are not so effective, but overall they have a good space in the pharmacopoeia to treat cancer from the palliative point of view. Now let's go to the second part of the, of the talk, and that means whether cannabinoids can have anti-tumor effects. I'm not talking now about palliation, but I'm talking about decreasing the growth of the tumor. The answer is that we still don't know in patients, but we know in animals, and I will deal a little bit with this in the second part of my talk. Well, these were some experiments we did uh, about 15 years ago. The first one that we published in this field of cannabinoids and cancer, in the uh, cannabinoids and anti as anti-tumor drugs, in which you can see here some mice that have a tumor on their skin. And this is a mouse that has been treated just with the solvent, I mean, in which cannabinoids are diluted. That, that is what we call a control mouse. This is a mouse that has been treated for one week with TAC. You see its tumor. And this is a mouse that has been treated for one week as well with a synthetic compound that resembles TAC. That is what we call a synthetic cannabinoid, a cannabinoid that is not produced by the plant, but that we have made in the lab. So you can see that after one week of treatment, the tumors in these mice, in these cannabinoid-treated mice, were much, much smaller than the control mice, the mice that have been treated only with the vehicle, with the, with the solvent, with the excipient in which we dilute the cannabinoids. This is an example of mice with tumors. Let's go to another animal, just as an example. This is a rat. This is an MRI, a magnetic resonance image of a rat brain on the left-hand side before treatment and on the right-hand side after treatment with TSC. You can see here the eyes of the animal the ears of the animal, this is the neck, this is the brain, the two hemispheres, and you can see this white spot on the right hemisphere that is uh, pointed by the arrow, this is a tumor. This is a tumor on this rat um, brain in the right hemisphere, here looked from the upper part of the, of the brain, what we call an axial projection, here is from the back, what we call a, a coronal projection. You can see here the, the tumor as well. So after one week of TAC treatment, the tumor disappeared and it didn't relapse at all during the whole life of the animal. So these first experiments that were conducted some 15 years ago developed a new area of research within the cannabinoid field. That was whether these compounds, besides many other potential therapeutic applications, could be anti-tumor drugs. Whether they could decrease the growth of tumors. 
After 15 years of work by our laboratory in Madrid, in Spain, and other groups all over the world, this is the scheme more or less we have that I will summarize very briefly about the different actions that cannabinoids can make on a tumor to make it decrease its growth. Cannabinoids, you know, act via cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2 receptors. So the first thing we had to demonstrate it was that CB receptors are not only in neurons, are not only in other tissues of the normal body, but also in cancer cells. And nowadays we know that I would say every type of cancer cell expresses CB1, CB2, or both receptors. So cancer cells have those antennas, have those um, locks in which cannabinoids can enter, and therefore cancer cells are sensitive to cannabinoids. There are different processes, at least we know five different processes of a tumor that are um, responsive to cannabinoids and through which cannabinoids can decrease the growth of tumors. You know that tumors, as I represent here by these vessels, by these blood vessels, tumors must have access to blood because blood is transporting oxygen, is transporting nutrients. So every tumor needs to develop a particular blood vessel network to get the nutrients, to get the oxygen from the host, from the patient. So that process is called angiogenesis. So decreasing angiogenesis is one of the strategies nowadays to try to decrease tumor size. So cannabinoids, we have seen that in mice, they can decrease angiogenesis. They have different mechanisms, for instance, by acting through this molecule, doesn't matter now, but cannabinoids on the one hand can decrease the formation of blood vessels within tumors. So they decrease the supply of nutrients to the tumor. You know that cancer at certain stages can invade other tissues, can travel by the bloodstream to go to other corners of the body to make metastasis. And that is a very late stage of cancer and usually related to cancer mortality. So we know to, as well that cannabinoids can decrease the invasion and the migration of cancer cells to make metastasis on other parts of the tumors, so far in mice and in rats. Third, of course, cell, uh, cells that are making a tumor, when the tumor is growing, they have to divide. They have to mate from one mother cell to sister cells, four sister cells, eight sister cells, etc., etc. That is what we call the cell cycle or cell proliferation. So we also know that cannabinoids can blunt, can inhibit the proliferation of cancer cells. Cannabinoids can induce what we call the differentiation of cancer cells. What does it mean in a few, in a few words? So many cells in some aggressive cancers are cells that are not uh, in an adult stage. They are in a kind of embryonic-like stage so that they are very malignant. They can replicate, they can travel to other parts of the body. And when cells lose this embryonic-like st st uh, stage, they become, say, adult. They become mature. They become what we call in, in biology differentiated. So a cell of a tumor that is adult, that is differentiated, is very little malignant. Whereas a cell of a tumor that is very little differentiated, that is a newborn cell, that is an embryonic-like cell, is a very malignant cell. So cannabinoids can increase, can favor the differentiation, the maturation of cancer cells to make them less malignant. And finally, and the most relevant one for that reason I highlighted here, cannabinoids can induce directly the death of tumor cells. Cannabinoids can kill tumor cells by a process that in cell biology is called apoptosis. So all in all, by these five types of mechanisms, cannabinoids are very efficient in decreasing the growth of tumors in mice and rats. That is what we know after about 15 years of research. So how good can be cannabinoids, not only in mice and in rats, but of course what we want to, to know in patients regarding uh, anti-tumor efficacy? Well, it's very difficult, as you know, to go to clinical trials, to cl trials with humans, especially with cannabinoids, because they are compounds that are natural, they are in the plant, they, are, they say belong to nature, they don't belong to anyone, fortunately. 
So pharma companies cannot patent these compounds. So it's very difficult to get funding from the pharma companies to make a clinical trial with a compound that belongs to humankind and does not belong to them. They will not make money, they will say, if they go to clinical trials with them. Of course, there is, as well, you know, a lot of reluctancy among many medical doctors and among many, many authorities, medical authorities in many countries in the world because they still believe that cannabis are harmful, that cannabis are drugs that make you mad and so on, so on, so on. That uh, bullshit that still occurs in many countries in the world. So at the end, it's pretty difficult to go to clinical trials with cannabinoids, but we are into that, and little by little, we are seeing the light, and I will tell you later on, but it's taking quite a big effort. First, we have to convince oncologists that cannabinoids can be powerful, that cannabinoids can compete with current anti-tumor therapies. And what we have done in many different models of cancers in, in animal is trying to get the best combinations of cannabinoids, the best conditions to make cannabinoids work pretty, efficiently, pretty effic efficiently in these models of cancer. This is an example of what we have done so far and one of the most representative, uh, illustrative examples of this. In this case, we have combined TAC with another anti-tumor drug that is being used nowadays for brain tumor patients, for glioma patients. This is a very malignant type of cancer that has no solution today. There are only some therapies that act a little bit, a little bit, just as you have an idea. These therapies can increase the lifespan of a patient in two months, no more than that. That is the best one can do with chemotherapy in, in brain cancer patients. And the most important drug in brain cancer uh, treatment is temozolomide what I abbreviate here as TMC. This is a drug that is a chemotherapeutic drug that is the one that is used nowadays everywhere in the world, in Spain, in Czech Republic, everywhere you go, neuro-oncologists use this drug. It's the only one that can do a little bit to prolong the life expectancy of these patients. So what happens in mice when we give them TAC? This is the tumor of the, that in the mice, the size of the tumor in the mice, and this is the day of TAC treatment. So you see in, in mice in which we haven't added any drug, mice only treated with the solvent, what we call the vehicle, these are the control mice. These mice have a brain tumor and the brain tumor increases very dramatically a long time, about 10 times an increase in volume in two weeks. These are very aggressive tumors, not only in humans, but also in mice. What happens when we treat these mice every day with TAC? You see that in this precise, very aggressive type of tumor, TAC decreases the size of the tumor. How is TAC compared to the best drug that is nowadays on the clinics, the only drug I would say in breast cancer therapy, that is temozolomide? You see, very similar. I mean, in this particular experiment, Temozolomide was better in our hands. In other experiments we have done, TAC is a little bit better. So we can say that TAC can compete with temozolomide, at least in mice. You see there is the decrease in tumor size by temozolomide. But the most important data that comes out from this experiment, what happens when we put together TAC, the experimental drug, with temozolomide, the well-established drug? As you can see here, TAC plus temozolomide exert a very strong cooperative effect that decreases very, very, very dramatically the size of the tumor. In fact, these mice have a net decrease in tumor growth, and sometimes the tumor even disappears in these mice. So if we go to, want to go to the clinics with cannabinoids for brain tumors, it's very likely that cannabinoids per se can have some effect, but most likely, if we combine TAC with another drug, with a conventional chemotherapy, we will have a much, much better effect than either exerted by TAC alone or by temozolomide alone. So in this respect, this is one of the uh, types of cancer in which we have succeeded in going to the clinics. This is the typical evolution of a 
glioma patient, as a brain tumor patient. This cancer is extremely aggressive together with pancreatic cancer. It's the two, uh, they are the two most aggressive types of tumors nowadays. And when a glioblastoma multiforme, that is the name of this aggressive brain tumor, is diagnosed, some patients can be operated. They are treated with radiotherapy together with temozolomide and therefore with temozolomide as well, alone, as we call the adjuvant chemotherapy. And in this primary glioma, sometimes the size decreases, but after a few months, one year at the most, the tumor appears again, the tumor relapses. We have a secondary, a recurrent, a relapsing tumor that grows extremely fast and usually kills the patient in about four or five months. So when we go to clinical trials, and that's a problem also at the beginning, one has to start from the late stages of the disease. The standard therapy is this one everywhere in the world, and although it is not extremely effective, it's the one that is admitted nowadays in official medicine. So we have to go to patients that have passed these standard therapies. These standard th therapies didn't work because there is a secondary tumor that comes out, and then here in the relapsing stage is where we can treat patients. So the trial that is being conducted that is announced in this official uh, web page of the US uh, National Cancer Institute is a trial in which cannabinoids in the form of Sativex, that you know is a combination of TSC plus CBD, plus other cannabinoids as well, but mostly TSC and CBD, cannabinoids are combined with temozolomide. So this trial is being conducted nowadays in the United Kingdom. It started some few months ago, and maybe in a couple of years' time will tell us whether Sativex combined with temozolomide has some important effect or not in, in, in brain cancer patients. This trial it was conducted with Sativex because it was the only way that we could have the European regulatory agencies to approve a clinical trial with cannabinoids. We cannot convince them at all to use cannabis oils or something like that. They need, they only approve trials with official medicines. So that's a problem also in the field of, of cannabis because we can only go to trials with official medicines. But at, well, at least if this trial works, we will know that TEC plus CBD, irrespective of, of whether it is in Sativex or in a cannabis oil preparation, works together with temozolomide. And that is our goal, in fact. So, but still, we will have to wait to about two years for this trial to be finished. Do you know that, that there are other pieces of news during the last couple of months that may, can make us a little bit optimistic in this field of cancer? Because some other uh, trials or medicines are started and they can give us some hints as to whether cannabinoids can be anti-tumor drugs in, in patients. So for instance, um, one month ago, a drug company in the United States, INSYS, got the approval of the Federal uh, the Food and Drug Administration, that is, that is the regulatory agency in the United States for conducting clinical trials and for approving medicine for cannabidiol for the treatment not only of epilepsy, that most likely you know that cannabidiol is very effective in treating uh, pediatric epilepsies, but now for the treatment of brain tumors. So now there is a company in the States that is going to start using cannabidiol for the treatment of glioma under the approval, I mean not illegally, but legally under, after the approval by the FDA. FDA has given the approval not as a first line uh, treatment, as a standard treatment for gliomas, but for gliomas that did not respond to the standard treatment, what we call the orphan drug designations. An orphan disease is a disease that cannot be treated with the with the standard therapy. So at least with this uh, official approval, patients, some patients in the state will be able to benefit from cannabidiol for the treatment of their gliomas, besides all the people that are taking cannabis extras and so on, so on, so on. But it, in this case, they can make it legally. And also, there has been another trial that will start, I think, this month or in a very couple of weeks' time. It's a trial that is being conducted in Jerusalem, in Israel, 
by and that is sponsored is centralized by this uh, uh, hospital, the Hadassah Medical Organization, and they will use as well CBD for the treatment of cancer. In this case, it's not a precise, a unique type of cancer. It's CBD for 60 patients with solid tumors. There will be a mixture, of course, of patients. Some patients will come out with breast cancer, some others with prostate cancer, some others with colorectal cancer, etc. So most likely this trial will not give us a very precise uh, uh, set of data of whether cannabinoids can be effective in this precise type of cancer. Because if they are going to enroll some 60 patients, there will be, for instance, six with breast cancer, eight with prostate cancer, four with colorectal cancer, two with pancreatic cancer, etc. But the advantage of this trial is that it will cover a large array of different types of tumors. So they will need, most likely, they, it will not give precise information, but it will give very nice hints as to whether cannabidiol can be effective in this or that type of cancer. But again, we will have to wait about two, three years to have the data of this trial and see what's going on. So in the meantime, this is what we know. Unfortunately, we are quite advanced in the knowledge of what cannabinoids do in animals, but very far of getting to know what cannabinoids do in cancer patients. We, have, we must have patience and we have to put all our efforts in these trials, but as I told you, it's, not, it's very complicated and it's not simple at all to get permissions to, to conduct these trials. But what is overall my opinion about the state of the art, the current situation of cannabinoids as potential anti-tumor drugs? Well, the first thing we have to keep in mind and never forget is that cannabinoids is a very a strong disease. I mean, the enemy is very strong. We are not dealing about uh, pain in, in a finger. I mean, we are dealing with cancer, and it's one of the most terrible diseases that now they occur on, on the earth. Not only that, but can cancer is very heterogeneous. When we talk about cancer, we, that is a popular, a lay citizen a, a word, but cancer is a very complex mixture of diseases and every type of cancer is different. In fact, the therapies that now are nowadays approved for many different types of cancers are usually employed only for one precise type of cancer or maybe for two, for three, but there are no single cancer therapy nowadays that is valid for the about 200 different types of cancers that the World Health Organization has typified so far. So there are 200 different types of cancers, there are 200 different types of diseases. So we cannot be so naive to think that cannabinoids are going to be effective in those 200 different types of diseases. Cannabinoids could be effective and that would be really nice in some types of cancers that will be not so effective in other types of cancer and most likely they will not be effective in other types of cancers. So we have to think about first the enemy the weapons the enemy has, and second, what precise enemy we want to kill, and not the whole army of cancers. Of course, it's very nice to test all of them, but that will take centuries, I would say. That will take a very long time, but at, at least if we get to know the most prevalent types of cancers, the 10, 12 most prevalent types of cancer, most likely we will cover about 90% or 95% of cancer, of cancer patient populations. What is the laboratory animal, what we call the preclinical, before the clinics, evidence that we have? I would say, and I would dare say, and state and claim that cannabinoids are effective drugs. They are pretty good drugs to treat at least some types of cancers, and I would specify some models of cancers in mice or rats. And I say models because, as you most likely know, and well, I'm sure you know, when we develop a disease, irrespective of whether it's cancer or Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or epilepsy or whatever disease in a mouse, that disease is not exactly the same as the disease that occurs in humans. The disease that is developed in a mouse is always much simpler than the disease that occurs in a human. So curing a mouse is difficult, but curing a human is much, much, much more difficult. So when we have good data in mice, we have to be cautious, and we, of course, cannot 
extrapolate that to humans directly. Many things, many drugs for many different diseases do well in mice, work well in mice, but they don't work in humans because we are more complex and much weaker animals, by the way, than mice. What happens about all those reports that come out in the internet, so many patients calling and writing, and in the last uh, years, it has increased, the size of the ball has increased really very largely. I mean, some four or five years ago, just to tell you an approximation, I received about one email or one call from patients every three or four days. And now I have four or five calls, emails, etc., per day. So it is true, and that is very nice, that people have lost their fare to use cannabis. There are many reports in the Internet. There is a lot of mouth-to-mouth -mouth information uh, transfer about the potential beneficial use of cannabinoids in cancer as palliative and as maybe curative drugs. That is what we call, uh, usually what is called in, in medicine, anecdotal information. It doesn't mean that it's a despective word. I mean, it, it's anecdotal because it comes from one patient, from another, from another, and not from a large cohort of patients of 2,000, 3,000 patients altogether. I would say that it is possible, and I do believe that in some patients there has been effects. And of course, it's very desirable. I would love that some patients would have cure of cancer because of, of cannabis. But I think that although it is possible and desirable that cannabis preparation have had some good effects on cannabis, on patients against cancer growth, I would say that overall the evidence is still not very strong. Because first of what I told you, what type of cancer? I mean, there are many cancers in which cannabinoids have not been tested, or at least we don't know that anyone has used cannabis for those patients. There are many different types of cancers at different stages. People usually do not take cannabinoids alone. They take cannabis together with other standard or complementary or alternative uh, therapies. They change their diet, they do exercise, they try to sleep better, they try to do yoga, they try to use whatever. So at the end, we don't know what has the real cause of the apparent cure of that cancer. Has it been cannabis alone? Has it been cannabis mixed with other therapies or other changes in the habits of, of that person? Has been the standard therapy together with cannabis, etc., etc. When a person claims that his or her cancer is cured in the internet, that's really good news. But what happens two months later? We don't know whether that person has died. We don't know whether that person is still cured. We don't know whether that person is getting worse or getting better, etc. So the information, unfortunately, is still very, very poor overall, I would say. Although I know people personally that have been using cannabis under the supervision of a, of a doctor, under his or her own supervision in a very strict manner, and I do rely that some people have benefited from cannabis in decreasing the progression of their tumors. But I don't know whether that can be extrapolated to the 100,000 people most likely that nowadays are using cannabis in, in a non-controlled manner. So I wish that it, it is working. I really wish that it is working, but I don't know whether it's working. So the clinical evidence at the end is that we have some hints, we have some gut feelings, we have some examples of people in which most likely cannabis has worked, but still it is necessary and again desirable, I think, that exhaustive, very robust clinical studies are conducted to determine whether cannabinoids can be used other than for their palliative effects, which are better established, as I told you, as anti-tumor drugs to treat cancer patients. As my wish and all my will will be that those trials will be conducted in the near future. We know that, as I told you, that some of the trials have already started. We still do not know the data, but we still know, have to know which precise types of patients in which precise types of cancers and in which precise conditions can benefit from cannabis uh, in the cancer field. I'm very optimistic. I would bet that some of, I would bet that cancer will have uh, cancer will stop growing or will decrease its rate of growth upon cannabinoid treatment in some patients, but still we will have to wait for a few years to try to standardize the preparations, the conditions, and that I will be able to convey to you that cannabis is effective in this precise type of cancer patients under these precise conditions.
So hopefully in the next few years, I will be able to convey to you some new information on this. So thanks very much indeed for your attention. It was a pleasure to be here with you. Whatever question now or afterwards, I will be very happy to, to try to answer. Thank you. Questions? Dr. Z? Well, if anyone wants to talk afterwards, I will be very happy. I will be around the fair, so I will be happy to answer any question in, in private. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah, you uh, were talking about cannabinoids largely, but not specified on CBD or THC yeah. or combinations or whatever. Yeah. You know, maybe you can say something about yeah, it. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Well, I try to... Well, it was a very general talk, of course, and I had to summarize. In some instances, I specified because, for instance, these trials that have started in Jerusalem, they are with pure CBD. The trial that is all the application of uh, cannabinoids to pediatric gliomas that have been given approval by the FDA in the United States is also for pure CBD. The trial that is being conducted in the UK uh, with Sativex, of course, with Sativex, a combination of TSC and CBD plus other cannabinoids, we are trying to conduct, thanks to the person you have on your right hand side, Luke Kroll from the Medical Cannabis Bike Tour. We, they are sponsoring a clinical trial in Madrid in which we are involved, and hopefully, we will be able to start by next year by mixing THC, pure THC with pure CBD in a one-to-one -one ratio. So those are, unfortunately, there are only those three plus this one that is on the way. The only trials that are being conducted in humans. In mice, we have used many different types of cannabinoids, not only THC and CBD in pure form, but different combinations of them in very different ranges. We have used also synthetic cannabinoids. We have used also natural cannabinoids or compounds that mimic the action of anandamide, etc. I would say that, in general, all the cannabinoids are anti-tumor, but because every type of cancer is different, and of course, therefore, because every model of cancer in mice is different, then, and every cannabinoid, every cannabinoid is not the same as its cousin or its relative. They have different peculiarities in their mode of action, as you know well. There are cancers in which TAC is better than CBD. There are others in which CBD is better than TAC. There are others in which mixtures are better than single compounds, etc. I would say that overall, TAC is better than CBD. But there are some cancers in which CBD seems to be as good as TAC in mice. For instance, breast cancer. In breast cancer, I would say that CBD is very strong candidate for going to clinical trials. In colorectal cancer, CBD is also very efficient. But in, for instance, in brain tumors, TAC is better than CBD. Or in pancreatic tumors, TAC is better than CBD. In hepatocellular carcinoma, TAC, at least in mice, is also better than CBD. So that depends on the tumor. At the end, I think the most mm, potentially successful therapy would be a mixture of TAC and CBD. And that is the reason for which we have chosen that mix of one-to-one. -one. Sometimes could be better two-to-one, some others one-to-two, but I don't think it's going to make a big difference. If we put together significant amounts of TSC and CBD in a patient, I'm sure that the patient will benefit from TSC and CBD. So why not mixing? And I think the, the main avenue of medical marijuana in general, not only in oncology, are those different mixtures of TSC and CBD, except for that particular diseases, such as epilepsy, for instance, in, what CBD, in which CBD is clearly better than TSC. Even TSC can worsen the status of an epileptic patient. But in general, I would favor TAC and CBD mixers in, in medical marijuana. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any experience with healing leukemia? Um, we have experience with leukemia in mice. And I have heard from two or three patients with leukemia. And unfortunately, not more than that. In the mice, it works. Cannabinoids work. Uh, mostly TSC, better than C CBD in this case. I'm talking about natural cannabinoids, there are other 
synthetic cannabinoids that are very efficient for leukemia. But in humans, we don't know. I mean, I've heard of some patients that are taking cannabis, and they seem to be doing well with cannabis, but I have lost their track, and they didn't call me or write me again. So unfortunately, it's one of the tumors in which we have, that is very prevalent, and we have little information. Yeah. Less than, for instance, in breast cancer, or the types of cancer in which more people take and more people convey their, their results. Well, that depends because uh, leukemia is also a very heterogeneous cancer. There are many different types of, of leukemia, the same as lymphoma. Overall, the immune tumors are very, I mean, the immune system biologically is very heterogeneous. There are many different types of cells, and the cancers that affect those types of cells are also, therefore, very heterogeneous. There are some leukemias that appear in very young patients, whereas some others appear in the adulthood. So, in general, the I mean, there are some therapies that are pretty effective for some very particular types of leukemias, but some other are more aggressive. So it's very, very variable. Some patients have, they can cure their leukemias even, I would say, where some others die in few years rather than months. I mean, they are not usually as aggressive as brain tumors or pancreatic tumors are. But they have been very much investigated and usually from the biological point of view, a particular leukemia is usually very, or rather homogeneous, at least compared to a brain tumor or a pancreatic tumor. So it's easier to use one single therapy or two therapies to blunt very efficiently sometimes the growth of a leukemia. Whereas in brain tumors, for instance, or in pancreatic tumors, there is a very complex mixture of cells Every cell has their peculiar mutations, their peculiar ways to evade the defenses of the host, and it's very complex. In fact, the malignant brain tumors are called glioblastoma multiforme. That words mean, of course, that it has made the aspect, even by eye, by naked eye, is very different in different portions of the tissue and of the cancer tissue. And that means that is because cells accumulate very different mutations, very different adaptations, and it's absolutely impossible to stop the growth of a glioma with only one drug, because that drug can be effective for 20% of the cells, but the remainder, 80%, escapes the drug. So those very complex cancers, what we call biologically polyclonal cancers, are extremely aggressive because the, the army is very varied, the weapons are very varied. Hello? Yeah. I would like to ask about uh, dosage. Uh, how many grams every day the mouse get? The grams of THC or micrograms, yeah. milligrams? Yeah, well, when we use drugs, not only in cancer and not only cannabinoids, when with animals, for instance, we work also in neurodegenerative diseases. We're also trying to, to know, to get to know whether cannabinoids can be neuroprotective uh, drugs. In general, when we give drugs, uh, in this case THC or whatever, to, to a mouse, usually the amount of cannabinoid that the mouse can cope with, that the mouse can stand, is much higher than that of a human. But that's also because they have a much more active metabolism, a much more active manner of detoxifying. So usually when drugs are given to animals, they are given about, just a, as an estimation, 10 times more than to humans. But that is not extremely high in the type of cancer we have decrease quite a lot the amounts of drugs that we, of TSCCVD and other compounds that we gave in our uh, first experiments to mice, and even at very low doses, cannabinoids can cope uh, with, with tumor in, in mice. If we try to extrapolate, I would say that for CBD, if one wants to use CBD against cancer, as you most likely know, so far no one has been able to show any nasty effect of CBD in a patient. Can, uh, CBD, as far as I know, has been given in amounts up till 0.8 grams per day, that is 800 milligrams per day during two months to patients, and nothing seemed to come out. In these very large uh, trials, that has, or at least those individual cases that are being conducted in the United States for giving CBD to pediatric patients of epilepsy to kids that are suffering for epilepsy, sometimes CBD has been given two, three milligrams 
200, 300 milligrams per day, and nothing bad seems to occur. Of course, this doesn't rule out that maybe in five years' time there will be something that will come out. But so far, CBD seems to be extremely effective. And at those doses, we have doses comparable to the ones used in, in humans. So I would say that if we make CBD work in a particular disease in a mouse, we, it is relatively likely that it works in humans because humans can cope with similar doses of CBD compared to mice. That is not the case of THC. If we go beyond 30 milligrams of THC per day or 40 milligrams of THC per day, I mean, we will have a very remarkable high and our life, average life will not be easy even if we put together TEC with CBD, so that CBD improves, as you well know, the tolerability of, of TEC. In that respect, I think CBD is more promising because we can go to very high concentrations, to very high doses in humans. Even I would say maybe one gram per day and maybe it wouldn't do anything bad to, to the person. But the problem is that TEC works in certain diseases, but it doesn't work as well as TEC in other diseases. You know that TEC acts via binding to these cannabinoid receptors on the cells of our body, of our brain, etc. Whereas CBD has a very little affinity for those receptors. So in diseases in which cannabinoid receptors are not so relevant, maybe CBD is very relevant. But if CBD, if cannabinoid receptors are very relevant, I think that TSC must be in the in the medicine that we are giving to the patient. And we have a limit. We have the limit that is imposed by the psychoactivity of TAC. So we have to look for regimes of administration that decrease their psychoactivity. And one of them, of course, as I said, is mixing with CBD to improve the tolerability of TAC. So I would say that with CBD we can go very high. We don't know how much high we can go, but maybe close to one gram per day for a certain time of time, or at least half a gram per day, maybe it can be tolerated by a person. With TAC, I think going more than 40, 50 milligrams per day, it's usually complicated. Thank you. And as I said, if anyone wants to, to talk afterwards, I will be happy.